I mean, it's like anything else, you know, whether you're ordering a biomarker test, whether you're ordering a CBC on a post-operative patient. It needs to be an actionable event. It has to change how you're going to manage that patient. And you know what? If, if you're just getting it for, and it doesn't really change anything, so why get it? So let, let, let's kind of move back. So, Mike, your point, and I think, Dr. Cheatham, your point also is that the use of MRI. You know, again, I think this is, is it going to be, is this going to be a one winner? Is it going to be a biomarker? Is it going to be MRI? I think we're, we're going to, there's probably going to be a combination of both. You know, we, we all know that, that current biopsy schemes, your traditional standard sextant 12 cord biopsy, grossly underestimates the cancer that's present. It also doesn't do a good job of basically predicting what's going to happen to that patient. I think the biggest, the biggest problem is, is that the imaging, it's the, we've used the same imaging, transrectal ultrasound, dating back to, you know, dating back to the mid-80s. Um, so again, I think this concept of multi-parametric MRI with, with fusion ultrasound and biopsy is going to probably be the wave. Is it perfect? No. It does depend upon a really good radiologist. It depends upon, again, I think the urology world to embrace this. My rationale for wanting to, 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 for the urology world to do this is, A, number one, we should do it. I think we, we will continue to be, again, the people that, that should be in charge of diagnosing prostate cancer. I think if we don't do it, we could get bypassed on this whole equation with the new ACO models. Um, I think, again, even though right now from a reimbursement standpoint, it's a little bit of a lost leader. I think it is important, you know, for us. I think uh, again to to work though, you know, with the biomarker companies. So, the programs that I, I know are out there that that are doing a lot of multi-parametric MRI have specific protocols in place. But also, you know, and clearly one of them are these patients with a negative biopsy, and you're scratching your head thinking, did I miss it? And if they have a family history, if they're African-American, if they have some suspicious features on their first histopathology, whether it be high-grade PIN and atypia, what can I use? And again, taking into account what you said, there is some significant morbidity to ultrasound and biopsy. There's bleeding, infection, resistance, you know, those types of things. So in terms of the tests that are out there now in that particular space, so we have a urine-based test, which is, which is basically the uh, PCA3, which, which again is approved for patients with a negative biopsy uh, with PSAs between 4 and 10. And then, as you know, it's relatively simple to do. It's a prostate massage, and then it's urine, urine based. And then there are also two, two tissue tests. One is, uh, one is confirmed DX by the MDX Health Group, and the other is the PCMT assay uh, by the Mitomics Group out of Thunder Bay, uh, uh, Ontario. So again, those last two are tissue-based. They all work in a different fashion. Um, Ken, are you using any of those on a, on a routine basis? Or? Again, I, I think you know, we're, we're using them. Not necessarily, they're not necessarily a, uh, abject. We order them if it's a negative biopsy. But on those patients that, you know, like you said, you really have that index of suspicion. Like, I'm, I'm shocked that the biopsy came back negative, whether it was their free PSA was so low or the rate at which their PSA rose and rose consistently. Those are the patients that were, were either, either utilizing the, uh, the uh, mitomics test or the uh, confirm X, MDX test. And that has been very helpful to say, hey, look, we're going to go back and re-biopsy specifically in these areas. Uh, and we've, we've, found, we've found disease. We've also not only used the parametric with the MRI, but we've also done some saturation biopsies transperineally, which again kind of alleviates the, the risk of the infectious component to it as well. Are you doing much transplant templated I, biopsies? Not very often. Uh, we actually utilize a lot of the MRI now to kind of allow that. And the, one of the caveats with MRI that really needs to be addressed is that this is not something that you can do within a few weeks of the TRESS biopsy. Otherwise, you get completely false results. You won't get what's there. You have to wait at least six weeks until afterwards. So normally what we'll do is we'll wait a period of time, about between six weeks and three months, bring them back in another PSA with the MRI at that time and see if we can identify a lesion. If these things are large enough, then it's one of those things to kind of proceed with. 
part of it, part of me is kind of changed from before, where if we were finding elevation in PSAs, if I'm having to look this hard to find prostate cancer, do I really need to be treating the prostate cancer? And so for me, that philosophical change is kind of, has kind of taken a step back. And so I don't utilize saturation biopsy as much as I would have five, five eight years ago. You know, it's, it's definitely changed dramatically in that aspect. I think clearly what they're finding in terms of the data that I've read is that, A, number one, I think your first point is that it does take a dedicated radiologist. There is, there is not a standardization of how to read these things, and I think that is a challenge that certainly the, the Europeans have been looking at. Uh, that needs to be addressed. I also think that you know, how these are done, uh, like anything else, this is not just put the probe in, bam, bam, bam. You know, this, this takes about 20 to 25 minutes, is my understanding. Uh, and you know what's also interesting is that the significant number of anterior zone tumors that are being picked up. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that paper that was presented at, a, uh, at SUO in December about the Hopkins data that had tw in, in the African American population had 20 to 25 percent anterior zone tumor was actually pretty interesting. It's also recently been presented that 60 percent of patients who have community MRIs when they're actually reviewed by a dedicated prostate radiologist are found to have suspicious lesions and the problem for that is that if the patient has already had an MRI in the community and they come to us for a second opinion you've already burnt your bridges with the insurance company about having that prostate MRI approved for a second time and then it puts the onus on the patient as to whether they want to pay for it if the insurance company is not willing to pay for a second MRI when the first MRI just didn't give us the information that we wanted to. One of the concerns I have for patients is that patients are aware about the risks of biopsies. Many patients are very frightened that a prostate biopsy may spread cancer. We know there's no evidence for that, but it's- I mean, if air gets to it? <laughs> <laughs> but, pa but patients are generally still very concerned that biopsies may spread cancer, even though we know there's no evidence for that. It's certainly something that will often deter patients from having a biopsy. My concern is the patients who have the negative MRI and the negative PCA3 and then say, hey doc, does that mean that I don't need a bi biopsy if you have other concerns, either based on elevated PSA, PSA density, free to total PSA. And I think the PCA3 is much more useful when it's a positive result that we may be missing cancer. We've all got patients who have confirmed prostate cancer diagnosed on a biopsy with a negative PCA3 result. And obviously some of those patients have got low grade, low risk disease, but we know it's not a perfect test either. Right. So then that last bucket, which is probably the one that has the most attention really over the past couple years is, is really the, the assays that are available for patients who meet criteria for active surveillance. So you're thinking about active surveillance or they, need, they want some more genetic proteomic information and you're trying, they have a positive biopsy and you're trying to determine aggression. And again, who, who, needs to be th who needs to be on treatment? Who needs to be on active surveillance? And again, I think this becomes a much bigger issue. Again, we know from the Hopkins paper last year, looking at, looking at traditional 12 core is that people in, in low risk or very low risk, a significant number of those patients um, actually get upgraded pathologically at the time of radical prostatectomy. So we need that we need to do a better job of of determining the biologic potential of these prostate cancers. So the currently available tests that are out there, so that we know that uh, that that genomic health uh, has their Oncotype DX uh, GPS score. And the, you know, their assay is, is, is looking at expression of 17 genes, and basically they want to predict aggressiveness of disease. We know that there's the, the Myriad assay Prolaris, and again, uh, that measures the potential risk of dying of prostate cancer. We know that there is a company uh, called Metamark that is going to be releasing some data uh, looking at their uh, Promark assay, I believe it's called, that again is looking at aggressiveness. Uh, there is a company based out of California, Genome DX, that has their Decipher assay. Uh, again, a little bit of a different player here in that they are looking at patients who have undergone radical retropubic prostatectomy or, or robotic prostatectomy who have pathologic 
uh, features that may that that patient may need adjuvant radiotherapy for localized control. So their decipher assay is uh, is again being being used or they want it to be used to give a better prediction of who actually would benefit from adjuvant radiotherapy post radical prostatectomy. Neil, big bucket. Where do you think we're going with all this? So uh, it's interesting. I think we're, it, it, they're all tremendous advances, these um, genomic assays that you talked about, the proteomic assay of uh, Metamark, the Promark test. Um, <clears throat> none of them have CMS approval. Um, uh, some, most of these companies have done fabulous work validating their assays to their credit. Really great science, great science. And not just once, but twice. And, um, and, and additionally, they all have to move forward with multi-institutional, not single institution, both academic and community-based, multi-institutional prospective trials demonstrating that it really has a change in physician behavior. Uh, because uh, that's where we're going to see benefit to patient and also uh, cost comparative effectiveness. So they're all doing that to their credit, um, and, and we've been involved in many of those. So it's, that's been quite nice. So I, I think they're, they're tremendous. I think that these are going to give us more information. If you look at a lot of the studies that were done in a multivariate analysis, this gives the clinician independent statistically significant validated information on top of typically PSA, DRE, and the histopathology. So walk us through, I think.